Now then, the age of Aquarius then. Uh, I saw on the on YouTube a couple of weeks back a lady who was infusing about the fact that the age of Aquarius had actually started on St. Valentine's Day, February the 14th, 2009. And you, you probably know that, well, at least for the last 100 years or so, there have been all kinds of dates presented for the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Yeah? Lots and lots of different kinds of dates. And you can get a bit of confusion about this. Well, when, when is this age actually supposed to be occurring? And of course, the famous song, which I'm, I'm sure some of you will remember from, from the musical Hair back in 1969, I think it was, yeah? Um, how, how did it go? You know, when the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars. Remember the rest of it? Then peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars and chorus. Yeah, remember that? Um, of course, the problem with that is the moon is in the seventh house every night. Because the Earth, you know, the, the, as it were, or not every night, but you know, the moon goes round the Earth, doesn't it? Regularly. And Jupiter aligns with Mars, not infrequently as well. It's not a completely rare event by any means. But certainly on the 14th of February, there we see Jupiter, Mars and Jupiter in alignment. 7 degrees and 9 degrees. And here's the moon over here in the 7th house. Yeah, that, that was the case. But... Um, I would like to try and show you now how, in fact, that it was not the case that the age of Aquarius began in 2009. Um, the origins of our understanding of astrology, our zodiac system, which we use today in the West, go back to Babylonia and Chaldea, Mesopotamia. And the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, who were great astronomers like the Mayans, they looked uh, in the heavens and they identified four stars, two in particular, which they then used as an axis for their understanding of the heavens. And these two stars were uh, Aldebaran in Taurus and Antares in the heart of the Scorpio. And the other two stars, Regulus in the constellation of Leo and Fomalhaut in the constellation of Aquarius. You can see them there. Leo, Aquarius, Scorpio, and Taurus. And the Babylonians felt that these, these stars, which of course for them were not just stars, not just bunches of rock and gas floating around in the heavens. For them, these stars were simply the physical bodies of beings. So, for example, when I look at AD here operating his camera, yeah, I'm not just looking at him as you know, blood and flesh and bones and things which we can calculate and quantify. How many cells does he have in his, in his eyebrow or what have you, you know? But the point is that when we look at another human being, we're looking at a spiritual being as well. And the Babylonians, that's how they saw the stars. They were gods. They were beings with consciousnesses far greater than ours. So they, they looked in the heavens and they saw, they felt, they experienced the activities of these gods, these beings up there. Um, and they located them in these places in the middle of these constellations because they felt that there were 12 equal powers in the heavens. Now you can find some astrologers these days will make the constellations of unequal length. And that's often because the constellations do actually physically look bigger. Some look smaller. Some look bigger, according to where you draw the lines, so to speak. Yeah? But that's a physical um, phenomenon. And for the Babylonians, they felt, no, that these are 12 equal powers in the heavens. So they divided the sky equally into 12 equal divisions. <coughs> and they located these axis stars in the middle of their respective constellations. So these stars are placed at 15 degrees in each constellation. Each constellation being obviously 30 degrees, yeah? 30 degrees within the, 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 the whole. Um, so that's how they divided the heavens, and then on either side of these four royal stars, these key stars, they located two other constellations. So you've got four groups of three, hence the twelve. Um,
Now, before I just talk about this, I, I presume you're all familiar with the, we're all familiar with the spring point, the vernal equinox, yeah, the spring equinox. So if we, if we, you know, you've got that point in the year where day and night are, are in balance, yeah? The length of the day, length of the night are in balance. And you've got the spring equinox and the autumn equinox. And then we've got the summer and the winter solstices. So the spring and the winter equinox, if you were able to, say, before, the, um, before it was really bright, if you were able to sort of look behind the sun on that day, you would see the constellation of Pisces rising. And that point, where, that, where the day and the night are in balance, that point gradually moves very slowly. And it takes 72 years for that point to move one degree. Forgive me if this is familiar to some of you, yeah? but I think it's important that we, we establish the facts, so to speak, yeah? because these are purely astronomical observable things. And that moves 72 degrees, sorry, 72 years, one degree. That means in 30 degrees, it will, it will take 2,160 years to get through one sign of the zodiac. Is that all right? <coughs> yeah? So where we are now, where the spring point is now, is between five and five and a half degrees in Pisces. That means we still have five degrees, five and a half degrees of Pisces to go before the spring point moves into the sign of Aquarius. Now for those of you who like doing arithmetic, you can do the calculation, right? Five and a half, five, five and a half degrees times 72 years, where does that get us? It's about 2375. That means the spring point is not going to move, spring equinox is not going to move into Aquarius and the age of Aquarius is not going to begin astronomically until um, 2375, which obviously is not 2009, it's not tomorrow, it's not any time soon. In the great scheme of things, it's a very short period of time, astrologically, astronomically. But in history, a lot can happen in 300 years. So, astronomically then, the age of Aquarius begins in 2375. To three seven hundreds, but that's up there in the heavens. And so here's a, a first sort of thought for you, which I appreciate can only be a sort of a hypothesis, and you have to look into history to, to try and bear this out. And it has to do with the fact that I'll come back to this. I think it has to do with the fact that um, the age of Pisces, which finishes then around there, 2375, started astronomically around this time, 215 AD, after Christ, yeah? 2,175, years. But when we look at earthly culture and history and see how things changed, then we find that, in fact, it's this period which becomes, is when the age of Pisces begins in our history. Yeah? Because before the age of Pisces was the age of Aries, the ram. And that started in the year 747. How do we know that? 747 BC. How do we know that? Because in that year, as I say, I've got to get a little detailed here, right? So please bear with me. In 747, King Nabonassar of Babylonia started the new Babylonian calendar. Now Ptolemy, who lived in Egypt a good deal later, not long around the time of Christ, he pointed out that in the Middle East, everybody recognized that this date of 747 was crucial for the, the understanding of history and um, civilization in the Middle East. So that was a date that was recognized, 747, uh, BC. 747 BC to 1413 AD gives you again 2160 years. 2160 years. The problem is that then we see there's a gap between 215 when we can observe in the heavens astronomically and mathematically that the age of Pisces uh, began 
1413, when earthly history sort of re re started to reflect that, there's a gap of 1200 years. We have to account for that. What causes this gap of 1200 years? Because you see, the age of Pisces, that was the time of Greece and Rome, yeah? Mm -hmm. 747, Rome was founded in 753 B BC. So from 747 BC until the 15th century after Christ, this period was totally dominated, at least in the West, by Greece and Rome, yeah? After the fall of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine, Byzantium, Constantinople, this came forward, and that continued the Greek and the Roman heritage together until that collapsed in the, 14th, in the 15th century. And we also see, of course, at that time, as Constantinople and Byzantium begin to collapse, that that wisdom and their books and everything are translated and moved over to the West, to Italy, where the Renaissance starts in the 15th century. And the Renaissance sort of bursts out like a tremendous autumnal blazing before the death of the age of Aries and everything that came with the Greco-Roman culture. Yeah? So new impulses really begin to come in at that time. Uh, I'm talking about this period here in earthly history. Okay? So this is a crucial period, the beginning of the, fifth, of the 15th century. A new age really starts to set in at this time. Yeah? But you can see there, if we carry that forward, 2,160 years, remember that means 30 degrees times 72 years, yes? 2,160 years, that's the length of time it takes the spring point to move through one sign of the zodiac. So that means that the end of the age of Pisces comes in 3573, now that's a long way in the future. So the age of Aquarius on our earthly historical plane is not set to begin until 3573. Um, so there's, as I said, there's this 1200 year gap, and how to, how to explain that? Well, one way to explain it is by this, the rotating Venus pentagram. You remember Venus is very important to the Mayans. They used it to, uh, to observe the heavens because it's such a wonderful heavenly clock. Its movements are harmonious, beautiful, regular. And it traces out in the heavens, in its meetings with the sun, it actually traces out this amazing pentagram, which is really very, very um, regular. So every eight years, there are five meetings of Venus with the sun. Um, if you, as it were, could look down on, on the zodiac from above, you would see these meetings in these places, yeah? And so one meeting here, then next here, 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 here. And then the sixth meeting <coughs> will take place a little bit further on. It won't return to exactly the same place. And so this means that the whole Venus pentagram has to rotate 